Welcome to the OC24 podcast, where we've taken some of the best talks and discussions from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime, which showcases some of the most interesting research into organised crime around the world. This episode is called Taking the Measure of Crime, the 2021 Global Organised Crime Index. Well, hello and welcome uh, to the 24-hour conference on global organised crime. My name is Antonio Sampaio. I am a senior analyst at the GI, and I dare say that this is a very special session of the conference as we will discuss the first Global Organized Crime Index. It's really a pioneering tool and one with breathtaking reach. It evaluates criminality and resilience for 193 countries around the world. Uh, the, the, the index, which is freely available online, is worth mentioning, provides the most comprehensive assessment to date of the pervasiveness of criminal markets by measuring both the influence of criminal actors as well as the effectiveness of resilience measures. The index certainly is uh, policy relevant, as we um, uh, experts uh, aspire to be, but it's also, I think, um, civil society relevant because it provides data to support the monitoring of state actors and governments entanglements with crime. Having said that, it's important to stress that the index is not meant to be an accusatory tool, but rather a catalyst to encourage dialogue. It also comes at a time of global crisis with the COVID pandemic continuing to have global socioeconomic and political impact. Uh, the index captures the year 2020, uh, but it's certainly relevant and will be updated every two years. This is also, uh, I believe, an important um, uh, an opportunity for you in the audience to contribute and help shape the future of the index, as you can write questions and comments via the Q&A function under the screen. But that will be, uh, we will address those after we hear from um, the core team of the index, who are Laura Adal, Lies Taxidia and Kozyu Ivanov, who are senior analysts at the Global Initiative. So I'll pass the word to Laura. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We are very pleased to be presenting you today uh, the first ever Global Organized Crime Index. Uh, we'll be going over a brief overview of the structure and methodology of the tool, uh, followed by some of the more detailed uh, highlights of the index results and findings. Uh, and finally, a bit on the key, some of the key takeaways um, and then all of the uh, interesting things that users can do when visiting our interactive index website. So with that, next slide, please. So to begin, I'd like to outline some of the goals of the index. Um, even though it is an index, uh, given the clandestine nature of organized crime, it's arguably more important to see past the index scores and numbers and really delve into the complex environments in which organized crime takes place. Um, so above all, our main aim is for the index to really serve as a catalyst for constructive dialogue uh, on the global issue of organized crime. Now, the uh, multidimensional nature of the tool, as you'll see, uh, allows users to gain a better understanding of the different relationships um, and causality between the different indicators. Um, and by doing so, uh, the index provides a framework uh, to promote more evidence-based research and analysis. Um, and of course, uh, importantly, we believe that the value of the index will only grow over time. Uh, so as future iterations of the index are developed, stakeholders will be able to use the tool um, to assess trends uh, in criminality and in resilience um, over time, with the index eventually developing a predictive function of, of future trends. Next slide, please. So having said all that, what is the Global Organized Crime Index? Next slide. Uh, so the index not only measures organized crime and related issues, uh, but also assesses countries' resilience to organized crime, recognizing that crimin criminality and resilience are interrelated um, and that the value of the tool is really enhanced when we're looking at both sets of dynamics. And so you see here on this slide, criminality is depicted by a quote unquote criminality pyramid. Uh, while resilience is shown by a, a sort of resilience wall. Um, and so the tool captures criminality by evaluating two components. First, the scope and scale of 10 criminal markets, which you see will make up the tail or the base of the pyramid. And second, four criminal actor typologies, which make up the height of the pyramid. 
And so the wider and the higher the pyramid, the higher a country's criminality score will be. At the same time, in assessing resilience, the index evaluates the existence and effectiveness of 12, uh, what we call building blocks of resilience. And so again, as you see here, the higher the wall, the higher the resilience score and vice versa. Next slide, please. So now turning to criminality specifically, uh, as I mentioned, criminality is broken up into two components. Um, so looking first at the criminal markets components, uh, the index covers 10 markets that you see are outlined here. Uh, and while each of these markets is a standalone indicator, uh, we can generally group these 10, 10 markets into four broad categories. And so we have the people-based markets, uh, which would cover human trafficking and human smuggling, the trade markets, in this case, arms trafficking, three environmental crime markets, which you see there in green, and finally, the four drug markets. Now, for the criminal actors component, what we've done is come up with four different criminal actor typologies recognizing that of course, not all criminal groups will fall neatly into one category or another. Um, and so first we have mafia style groups. And so these are groups that typically have a known leader uh, that are structured and that often control territory. Um, and here we would include groups like of course, traditional mafia style groups, um, as well as drug cartels, uh, but also militias um, and at times terrorist groups if they regularly engage in organized crime to fund their activities. Second we look at criminal networks. Um, so these are looser, less hierarchical uh, criminal groups that are more comprised of entrepreneurial type actors. Third, we look at state embedded actors. And so these are actors that are embedded in and act from acting from within state apparatus. And finally, fourth, foreign criminal actors. And this is really a catch-all category that includes any type of criminal actor, both state and non-state groups um, that are simply operating outside of their home country. Next slide, please. So now turning to resilience, uh, under the index, like I said, there are 12 underlying indicators, uh, which you see that are listed here. And just as with the criminality indicators, each resilience building block is a standalone and equally weighted indicator. Uh, but again, it is possible to group them into four broad categories that reflect the different parts of society. So this would cover things like leadership and governance, criminal justice and security, economic and financial issues, and finally, civil society and social protection. And so when taken as a whole, these 12 indicators really have the potential to provide holistic and sustainable responses to organized crime. Next slide, please. So now turning to the scoring methodology of the index. Um, now, the index as an expert-led assessment um, for each of the 193 countries that the index covers, two scores are assigned. First, Countries are led by their criminality score, comprised of criminal markets and actors. And second, countries are assigned their resilience score. Uh, now, all indicators in, under the index are scored on a scale of one to 10, based on scoring thresholds uh, that you see here. Now, for the criminality component, a score of one represents the best possible scenario, where the illicit market or actor type does not exist. And a score of 10 represents the worst possible scenario where the illicit market or actor type has an extremely negative influence on all parts of society and or state structures. Now, when determining scores for criminal markets, experts are asked to consider both the monetary impact of the market, so we're looking at the value of the market, uh, but also the non-monetary impact of the market, so the reach of the market. And so here we look at different factors like uh, the geographical concentration of the market, uh, how much violence is involved, uh, the number and the types of people who are involved or uh, victims of the market, the scarcity of the commodity, uh, and so on. Uh, similarly, when determining criminal actor scores, experts are asked to consider both the organizational capacity uh, and level of sophistication of each of the various actor types, um, as well as their overall influence on the state and society more broadly. So by contrast, um, for the 12 resilience indicators, that one to 10 scale is flipped. Um, so a score of one represents the worst possible scenario. In other words, the resilience measure does not exist. Uh, and a score of 10 represents the best possible scenario. In other words, where the resilience measure exists and is extremely effective. And so when determining the scores for each of the resilience indicators, experts are asked to assess two key elements. First, does the resilience measure framework exist? And second, is the measure effective in combating organized crime conditions 
in that country. So for example, we would not penalize a country for not having a wildlife trafficking law if wildlife crimes are not a major issue there. Now, one qualifier I'd like to note is that it's not enough that resilience measures exist and are effective in responding to organized crime. So in this sense, what we also look at is how the resilience measures are implemented and to see whether or not they meet international human rights standards. Uh, another important note on scoring for both criminality and resilience um, is that because of the way the index is structured, uh, countries that have more diverse criminal markets, for example, uh, will have higher scores than countries that may have just one or two extremely pervasive uh, market or actor. Um, and this is just because of how the index uh, calculates scores uh, by taking a simple average of all the indicators to come up with a final overall score. Next slide, please. So turning to the index development, uh, the actual scoring process was an iterative process, um, which you can see on that diagram on the left. Uh, we carried out initial research to create a preliminary profile for every country in the world, um, highlighting background information for each of the 26 criminality and resilience indicators. These profiles were then reviewed, amended, and scored uh, anonymously and independently through a series of thematic and geographic expert reviews. Um, and then input from these rounds were then consolidated and profiles then went through a series of evaluations, um, including consultations with our regional observatories uh, to make sure that scores were calibrated for regional and eventually global comparisons. And so in the end, uh, over 5,000 indicators were scored and reviewed with the process relying on over 350 experts worldwide, um, just to underscore how collective of an effort it was um, to, to develop a product that is comprehensive, accurate, um, and truly global. Next slide, please. So having said all of that, I've covered the structure and the methodology, we'll turn to the index finding. I'll be speaking a little bit on the general findings before handing it over to my colleague, Lias. Next slide. So one of the main index findings is that nearly 80% of the world's population live in conditions where criminality is pervasive and resilience is not sufficient. And we often like to use this uh, sort of uh, vulnerability matrix to, to show this. Um, and so you see here on top, we have the X axis that represents uh, the criminality and the Y vertical axis uh, representing resilience, forming four quadrants uh, where a score of 5.5 is the midway point. And so starting with that bottom left beige quadrant, this is where countries with low criminality and low resilience would be placed. Um, and so you see here that the majority of countries in the world, 77 of them, fall into this category. Now, right next to it, you see it in red, are where countries in the most dire situations are placed. And so here we have 57 countries that would have high criminality and low resilience. And so taking these two bottom quadrants together, we see that sort of grayish corridor covering both of them um, and showing that overall, 79.4% of the global population live in these countries with low resilience. So now moving up to the top left green quadrant, um, this is where countries would want to be. And so here we see 50 countries fall into this low criminality, but high resilience category. And finally, that top right sort of peach colored quadrant, which is quite small, only nine countries in the world fall into this high criminality, but also high resilience category. Um, taking this quadrant, Along with that bottom red, we see that sort of pink corridor covering both and showing that 79.2% of the global population live in these countries with high criminality. Next slide, please. Uh, here's just another representation of the vulnerability quadrants um, with just a small selection of countries from each of the continents um, to allow us to visually compare uh, thematically and geographically. Um, and so perhaps the, probably the most interesting are the countries that are really just right on the cusp, uh, right on the border that are in danger of moving over into another quadrant. Um, so for example, if you see right in the middle, very close to the middle, we see India just on the edge between low criminality and high criminality. Uh, same thing for Papua New Guinea, a little bit further down PNG um, or Botswana between on the left-hand side uh, between high resilience and low resilience while Ghana um, on the other side with high criminality, but just on that edge between high and low resilience. Next slide, please. 
again, here's just another way to depict essentially the same thing. Uh, countries in red are those that have been categorized as high criminality and low resilience. Uh, in pink, that high criminality, but also high resilience. Uh, in green, the low criminality and high resilience. Um, and again, in beige, that low criminality, but low resilience. Um, and so some other notable things that we've been able to pull out um, from these results include things like uh, countries with high criminality. Um, so those that are in that red color and that peach color, they make up about 67.7% of the global economy. Um, while countries with low criminality and low resilience, so that beige color, um, while they make up 40% of countries worldwide, uh, collectively, they only make up about 3% of the global GDP. And so you just see here on just on a macro level before there's so much information to unpack from the index results, even before delving into the more granular levels. Um, and so with that, next slide. I'll pass this over to my colleague, Leah. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, so turning now to um, a, a breakdown of, of the headline scores and, and looking first to criminality. So the criminality average um, is 4.87 out of 10. Um, and one of the key findings of the index is that when breaking down that um, criminality by, by continent, Asia um, exhibits the highest criminality score overall across the five continents, um, followed closely by, by Africa and the Americas. Um, and, and then Europe and in particular Oshana, uh, as you can see here, have, have lower, lower levels of criminality. And I think to an extent, you know, this isn't really surprising. You know, Asia is the most populous continent. It's uh, rich with natural resources. It's home to some of the world's largest economic powerhouses. Um, you know, Western Asia, which, which includes the Middle East for the purposes of the index, um, in particular, is a, is a notoriously fragile region, um, you know, in which several countries have experienced uh, or are experiencing currently uh, either conflict or its immediate sort of aftermath, um, you know, over the past past decade or so. Do you think highlights how important the combination of, of conflict and natural resources and weak democratic traditions are in, in sort of creating the vectors for organized crime? Um, you know, given the sheer size and, and the diversity in criminal markets that take place in Asia, either as source, transit or destination markets, um, and actually, you know, quite often as a, as a combination of, of all three of these types, you know, it may be expected that on average, Asia manifests the highest levels of, of criminality. Uh, next slide, please. But as we have stressed multiple times and we will continue to stress, you know, looking at the high level continental averages can only tell us so much. So when we break down the criminality results by region, actually only one region in Asia, and that's Western Asia, is in the top 10 highest scoring regions in the world. Um, as you can see here from the graph on the right hand side, Central America is the region with the highest uh, criminality average worldwide followed by Western Asia, as we discussed, um, and then East Africa, South America, and West Africa. The results at the other end of the spectrum, so the, the lower end of the criminality spectrum, um, however, do actually mirror more closely, I guess, the, the, the continental results. So Oceania, uh, Northern Europe, and the Caribbean have the lowest average criminality scores, followed by um, Western Europe and, and Southern Europe. Uh, next slide, please. So now turning to to resilience component, one of the key takeaways of the of the global index is that unfortunately, you know, levels of resilience to organized crime on a on a global scale are simply just very very low. So the global uh, resilience average is is just four point eight two, um, and as you can see here, you know, Europe by far exhibits the the highest levels of um, the highest levels of resilience, uh, followed by Oceania and the Americas with Asia and, and Africa displaying resilience levels below the global average. Next slide, please. But again, it's important to look deeper into, into what's, what's driving these broad continental trends. Um, and so breaking resilience down by region, uh, you can see that Northern Europe, Western Europe and, and North Africa are the highest scoring, um, and North America, sorry, are the highest scoring regions in the world. While at the other end of the spectrum, um, three regions in Africa, so that's Central, 
uh, East and North Africa display the lowest levels of resilience in the world, um, followed by, by Southern Asia and Central America. Next slide, please. So, you know, what exactly is driving the criminality results across the world? Um, which, you know, which criminal markets are most pervasive on a global scale? So human trafficking is, is identified as the most pervasive criminal market worldwide, um, followed by the cannabis trades, uh, arms trafficking, and human smuggling. But, you know, one of the questions we've asked is, well, what, what are the reasons for why these markets may be scoring so high? Well, when we compare the, you know, the most pervasive uh, and the least pervasive global markets, we start to see patterns that speak to the sort of the availability and the versatility of different commodities. So, for example, looking at human trafficking, not only is it, you know, that human beings are unfortunately the subjects of exploitation and, and you know, human beings are, of course, <laughs> needless to say, you know, everywhere. Um, but it's the fact that exploitation comes in many different forms. So from forced labor to organ trafficking and, and, and sex trafficking, that is one of the factors behind, you know, the global pervasiveness of human trafficking. Um, and, and obviously, you know, Laura said these scores uh, represent 2020. And, you know, while the, while the COVID-19 pandemic may have presented some initial challenges to, to human traffickers, it also allowed them to, to charge higher prices to overcome, you know, travel bans and, and movement restrictions. Um, and, you know, what's more is that where movement was simply impossible, you know, that meant that victims had no real chance to escape. So overall, you know, because the human trafficking market encompasses a range of, of illicit activities, you know, it can occur in any and every country in the world, regardless of self, size or wealth. You know, that's, that's why we see, you know, on a global scale, human trafficking is the highest scoring uh, criminal market. But I think, uh, you know, a similar thing can be said for the cannabis trade as well. Um, you know, although a small number of countries have approved um, sort of, a, you know, a legal regulated uh, medicinal use and recreational use markets for cannabis since, since 2018. And actually, you know, even in those cases, a black market exists to some degree still. Um, you know, in the vast majority of countries, it's still classified as an illicit narcotic. Um, you know, and this continues to, to, to drive, you know, the black cannabis market, um, much of which is controlled by transnational criminal networks. Um, and, you know, when, when comparing cannabis to, to the other drug markets, we see that, you know, synthetic drugs, uh, cocaine and, and heroin have, have much lower average scores globally. Um, and, you know, this could be because while, you know, those so-called hard narcotics could be dominant in some, you know, in certain source countries, their high costs and, uh, you know, a general pre uh, preference for, um, for, for other drugs, um, you know, explains why, why there could be a lower prevalence. Yeah. Um, by contrast, you know, cannabis can be grown in a, in a wide range of environments, nowadays almost anywhere actually, when you consider both, you know, indoor and outdoor uh, cultivation. Um, and it's, it's comparatively cheap for that reason. Um, and then, you know, touching on, again, the impact of COVID-19, the evidence shows that, you know, there, there has been a, or there was a decline in the use of, of party drugs due to, you know, lockdowns and other restrictions. Um, and we also saw, you know, conversely, a rise in the use of cannabis to deal with anxiety and depression amid the pandemic. Um, you know, then turning to the other end of the of, of the criminal market spectrum, flora crimes with the lowest prevalence globally could also relate to the issues of availability and, and versatility, but from the other way around, right? So, you know, the use of flora commodities may be comparatively limited um, and flora species are non-renewable. So, you know, the larger the market becomes, the fewer commodities there are to, to exploit. Um, and also, of course, you know, some countries just don't have flora species to exploit. So an illicit market is, is, is unlikely to be able to thrive in the same way as it would in countries, um, you know, with, with developed ecosystems. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows uh, which are the most pervasive criminal markets by continent. So, you know, as I'm sure you have gathered by now from, from our presentations and from the report and websites, we've managed to have a look. You know, organized crime is, is a complex and diverse phenomenon. Uh, which manifests itself in, in, in hundreds of different ways across the globe. 
Um, so, you know, human trafficking is the most pervasive market globally. Um, but also when looking at the results broken down by region, it also features in the top five markets on every single continent. Um, but, you know, interestingly, Africa and, and Asia, for example, are the only continents to feature two environmental markets in their top five. Um, in both cases, it's uh, non-renewable resource crimes and fauna crimes. Um, another noteworthy uh, finding here is that the Americas is, is the only continent where um, the most pervasive criminal market is a, is a drug market, um, which you know, reflects the importance of the cocaine trade in, in the organized crime landscape of, of the continent. Uh, and then finally, Europe and Oceania feature three drug markets in their top five, um, which I think reflects their role as, a, as an important destination market in the case of Europe and an increasing role now, um, albeit from a, from a lower level, um, but an increasing role as a transit and even a consumption market now uh, in the case of Oceania. Uh, next slide, please. So we've looked at criminal markets, but by exploring the dynamics of criminal actors, the index gives us an insight into how criminality is perpetrated. So, for example, even though um, you know, criminal networks can generally be thought of as, as the conduits of, of illicit flows within a country and transnationally, in fact, it's state embedded actors that are identified as the, as the dominant criminal actor type um, with a global average of 5.76 uh, out of 10. The I guess the form that that state embedded actors take in different countries varies, of course, you know, from from low level corruption to to sort of full on state capture. But the results clearly show the degree to which uh, criminality has permeated state institutions across the globe. Um, state embedded actors are then followed by criminal networks um, and foreign criminal actors uh, with and then with mafia style groups having the lowest average score. Um, so just to explain briefly the, the graph that we've got here on the right, this graph shows the score distribution uh, for all of the countries in the world. So, for example, um, mafia style groups, 43 countries scored a one for that actor type. So, in other words, you know, in 43 countries, that act, mafia style groups just don't operate. They don't exist. Um, domestic mafia style groups don't operate and exist. Um, and this shows that. You know, there are many countries around the world in which the notion of traditional mafia groups, you know, with a recognized leader, a known name and so on. The notion of those kind of groups perpetrating the organized criminal activity that, that happens in those countries just doesn't apply. Um, but by contrast, you know, for state embedded actors, you can see that there is a significant cluster of countries with high scores ranging from, from sort of six to nine. Next slide, please. And then here again is, is just a breakdown by continent, but this time for criminal actors. Um, so here again, you can see the, the third bar from the left, uh, I guess the sort of the most red bar uh, represents the state embedded actors. And you can see that actually they're the most dominant actor type in, in three of the five continents. So in Africa, uh, the Americas and Asia. Um, in Europe and Oceania, on the other hand, it's foreign criminal actors who actually are you know, often criminal actors from other countries within those same continents um, that dominate, followed by, by criminal networks. And next slide, please. But it is important to stress, uh, you know, as we have done many times and, and, and will continue to do, that it is just as important to consider countries' resilience to organized crime. Um, in terms of Sort of, I guess, in, you know, the results in terms of resilience results, what we saw most often was that while many countries had the necessary frameworks in place, um, showing, you know, which, which shows an expressed desire to combat organized crime to a certain extent, it was implementation that was lacking. Um, for example, here you can see from the graph, resilience indicators such as international cooperation uh, and national policies and laws scored the highest uh, among the 12 building blocks um, with global averages of, of 5.68 and 5.42 respectively. Um, but by contrast, economic and, and social resilience indicators scored significantly lower on average. Um, fortunately, you can see of the 
civil society and, and social protection measures um, and actually broadly sort of of, of the 12 resilience indicators overall um, non-state actors um, including which includes the media and, and civil society um, score comparatively high across across the 12 the 12 building blocks um, but you know at the other end of the spectrum the indicator for government transparency and, and accountability uh, represented the second lowest average uh, scoring 4.41 across all 12 resilience uh, building blocks, which speaks to um, what we discussed in the, in the previous couple of slides on, on you know, the pervasiveness and, and of, of um, state embedded actors. Um, and the link between state embedded actors and resilience is, is an interesting one and a crucial one, I think, for policymakers um, to, to, to bear in mind. Um, and that link is actually something that my colleague Kosio is going to um, delve into a bit uh, a bit deeper. So I will uh, next slide and pass it over to Kosio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lias. Uh, so as my colleague outlined just now, um, state embedded actors are the most dominant uh, criminal actor type um, in facilitating organized crime. Um, but as we go over the different indicators of the index, um, we begin to pull out some, some interesting relationships. And so we see that state embedded um, actors engaging in criminality is particularly um, troubling because in many cases, the very apparatus that is meant to be the driving force to counter um, organized crime can uh, perpetuate criminality and it is often a hindrance to the implementation of um, adequate countermeasures. Um, we are of course aware that the degree to which the state is um, involved in illicit activities happens on a, on a broad range, on a broad spectrum. Um, and it varies from country to country, ranging from low level corruption um, to a full state capture in which the state apparatus um, is uh, um, the predominant and often the sole perpetrator of illegitimate violence um, and of crime. Um, the implications um, of that finding affect not only criminality, but resilience as well. And um, as you can see uh, on the graph here, we have found that countries with um, higher uh, state embedded actor scores tend to have lower levels um, of uh, resilience. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, of course, what makes a country uh, more or less resilient to organized crime is uh, an extremely co complex subject. Um, to study and while the index provides a standardized way to, to evaluate criminality, uh, and resilience across a spectrum of environments. What we have acknowledged uh, right from the start of the creation of the tool is that in analyzing organized crime, um, states start off on uh, unequal footing, often through no fault of their own. Um, like criminality, there is no one size fits all approach to resilience. Um, and so no assumptions can be made about what makes a country more or um, less resilient. What the index has found, however, is that uh, govern governance does influence countries' resilience. For example, um, another key finding of ours is that countries categorized as full democracies on average um, exhibit higher levels of resilience than authoritarian states with a strong correlation uh, standing at 0 0.79 between the um, EIU's 2020 democracy index uh, and the Global Index Resilience Scores. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. In fact, four out of the top five countries with the highest uh, resilience scores are also um, in the top 10 countries of the 2020 Democracy Index. Um, at the other end of the resilience spectrum, 82% of the countries with the 20 lowest resilience scores um, are categorized as authoritarian states. Uh, of course, states that uh, states that are uh, participatory, accountable, effective, and founded on the rule of law um, provide a foundation uh, on which to build state and non-state frameworks that can counter uh, organized crime. Uh, in some authoritarian contexts, on the other hand, all organized crime um, as a state function may, may leave little room for other criminal groups to, to operate while in other instances, um, a state may franchise out its monopoly over resources or, or criminal markets to other um, criminal groups who act on its behalf. 
Uh, next slide, please. And another key point that um, is worth mentioning here is that conflict and instability were not only linked to um, criminality, where the highest scoring countries were those that were experience, uh, experiencing conflict and fragility, but also to, to resilience, where a strong negative correlation was found at zero point, uh, minus 0 0.87, as you can see here. Um, in conflict settings, uh, it might be the case that state attention is diverted to, to war efforts, which um, inevitably leads to uh, social, economic, and security institutions uh, weakened. Similarly, in, in conflict settings, um, when there is a dispute over territory or resources, um, territorial control and, and social cohesion are very likely to be diminished. Uh, all of these circumstances can lead to an overall decline um, in the resilience to organized crime, of course. Uh, but as we pull out these correlations, um, I'd like to take a step back for a moment and just point that um, the message we're trying to convey is not that rich and, and stable democracies are, are void from organized crime. <clears throat> uh, in fact, far from it. Uh, it is important to, to keep in mind that organized crime is, is everywhere. Uh, it may just look like uh, look differently from, from country to country. Uh, but what the results show us is that transparent and open societies where checks and balances are, are in place and where civil society, the media and everyday citizens enjoy um, high levels of, of freedom to pursue legitimate livelihoods and hold to account those that engage in criminality tend to be uh, less vulnerable to the threat of uh, organized crime. Um, next slide, please. Now on to the takeaways of the global index. Next slide, please. Uh, so first and fo foremost, it is essential that uh, the scale of the organized crime phenomenon um, is recognized by different stakeholders. Once that happens, uh, we can begin to take the necessary steps to address that based on a robust evidence base to which the global index contributes to. Um, this includes working towards ending the impunity of state embedded actors um, uh, to increase resilience, peace building and bolstering uh, democratic values um, as well as the rule of law. Uh, the index also highlights different aspects of, of organized crime but does so in a systematic and measurable way through both um, geographic and thematic lens. And so we encourage you all to visit our uh, interactive platform um, at ocindex.net and read the 2021 report that speaks to these, um, to these issues uh, and more. Next slide, please. Um, I'm now going to give you just a brief overview of the tool so you know what to expect when you go onto the platform. Next slide, please. So beyond the obvious um, access to rankings, the dedicated website also has a, a range of useful features. Importantly, you can download the report from there um, as well as gain access to uh, country summaries that explain national contexts and inform the scores behind each individual indicator. Um, so my appeal to you, if you haven't uh, yet had the chance to explore the tool, um, go on and do it by visiting ocindex.net. Um, I'm going to post a link for your convenience in the chat um, later on. Next slide, please. The website is um, quite useful in providing an overview of flows for specific criminal markets, the 10 markets, of course, that we cover. Um, users are able to, to filter heat maps by specific index component, allowing them to identify regional hotspots for any, any given commodity. The example that we have here is of, of heroin. You can clearly see the most affected, which uh, the most uh, affected nations are. Um, you can spot where production takes place, for example, uh, the Golden Triangle in Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, then the Golden Crescent, Afghanistan and Iran, um, and you can, of course, identify important transit nations such as Pakistan, for, in, for instance, um, with a very high score as a large portion of um, 
Afghan produced heroin transits through the country onto final destinations, or um, the Balkan route uh, and the East African coast heroin route below, um, also very distinguishable as you can see on, on the map here. Um, next slide, please. So the website um, allows you to, to get an overview of the spores um, and um, uh, of course, an overview of different, different crime markets and resilience um, indicators. Um, and to then go into the specific, uh, specifics for, for different regions, um, as well as uh, countries or other indicators. And then there is this really useful feature uh, called Data Explorer. It makes it possible for, for users to look at correlations between different indicators and then hypothesize about and analyze the, the set relationships. Um, an interesting example that we have on this slide um, is the correlation between non-renewable resources um, and state embedded actors. So results here demonstrate a strong positive correlation between the two indicators, meaning that the more pronounced the influence of, of state embedded actors um, is, the higher the score is for non-renewable crimes market in a give, given country and vice versa. Of course, uh, correlation does not necessarily mean causation, but a possible explanation here would be that non-renewable um, resources are often controlled by the state, which allows state embedded actors uh, the opportunity to take advantage um, and either facilitate or directly um, engage in criminality. Uh, next slide, please. And then lastly, as you can see um, on this slide here, the website also allows for side-by-side -side country comparisons, uh, which is of course also quite useful. W you can analyze the scores of countries, but um, of course uh, you can look at um, country summaries as well. The profiles that, these are the profiles that inform the scores. Um, they are, located right below these uh, two pyramids that you see um, on the slide here. Next slide. Yeah, uh, with that, I'm going to end the presentation here. Uh, there is just one additional thing that I would like to, to mention, mention before um, I hand back over to Antonio for the Q&A. Uh, please have in mind that if we don't have um, enough time to answer all questions, do get in touch uh, with the team on uh, OC index at globalinitiative.net. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kozio. Um, so we, we are now moving into the quest, question and answer uh, section of the, of, the, of the discussion. And I welcome you to please um, submit questions if you have them. Um, also comments um, for, for, for our panel to, to discuss. This is your chance. Uh, so um, I'll start with a question from Rick Hilaire um, about the, the category of non-renewable resources and which crimes fall under that category. And if I may add also this, um, this type of crime, um, uh, at least part of that in terms of minerals, um, has been traditionally associated with countries in conflict, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, if you could comment on uh, which crimes fall under that and what patterns you observed um, in that. And then we'll, we'll, we'll move on with some other questions from me and from others. Sure, I'll take that one. Uh, great question. So we define non-renewable resource crimes as the illicit extraction, smuggling, mingling, bunkering, or mining of any natural resources um, that would cover trade of products, um, price misinvoicing, and covering any commodities that relate to oil, gold, gas, gemstones, diamonds, and so on, but not necessarily limited to those. Uh, what we realized early on when developing the index that we could not specify particular commodities because they wouldn't necessarily be prominent worldwide. So what we asked experts to do was to uh, evaluate when considering environmental crimes, you know, the top five commodities um, in any given criminal market for that, for that country. 
Um, what I would encourage you to do if you have any questions on as far as definitions or the scope of any of the indicators, um, if you can go to uh, ocindex.net on the download section, we have uh, downloadable resources that um, define all of the different indicators, the types of questions that we ask experts um, to help guide them in the scoring and the assessment. Thank you, Laura. Uh, a question for myself. One of, of the important, very important um, reasons that we, we, we track and analyze uh, organized crime is its impact on human lives, on violence. So um, how does the, um, the issue of, broadly speaking, of violence, armed violence, uh, um, fits within the, 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 the index? Um, the, the, presumably, it affects importantly the, the 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 ratings for some for some countries if you could um you or 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 uh Lies or or cause you um explain to us how how uh, if you if you were able to draw some some analysis on 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 the incidence of violence in the different markets and relate relationship to, to to resilience or on on the other hand if um if violence, how violence itself, the, the incidence of violence affects the, the, the scores? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, you know, violence is, is, as everyone knows, you know, a crucial component of, of organized criminal activity and, and quite often, but not always, of course, um, you know, a key instrument used by criminal actors to, to sort of consolidate their power um, over local communities and, and illicit economies. Um, violence is such a cross-cutting theme that it's not included as a, a sort of separate standalone criminal market um, because of course you know violence is an important component of, of all of the different criminal markets to, to a certain degree um, so actually violence as a sort of as a, as a criteria fits into the assessment of um, both criminal markets and criminal actors as a, as a sort of like a, an aggravating factor in the, in the assessment of the scores for each of the, the 10 criminal markets and, and for the four for the four criminal actors. Um, so, you know, when scoring um, any of the, of the criminal markets, when scoring, you know, the cocaine trade or, or non-renewable resource crimes, violence is, is, is one of those factors that's considered um, to sort of aggravate the score of it. So, you know, all, all things equal, a cocaine market that has extraordinarily high levels of violence will score higher than a cocaine market that has very, very little, um, very little violence. Um, and, the, and then the same can be said for, for criminal, for criminal actors. So, um, you know, criminal networks that are um, sort of routinely involved in, in turf wars and, and, and shootouts and, and gang violence um, will, will score higher um, no matter, you know, irrelevant of their actual consolidation over the criminal market itself, uh, all other things equal, they will score higher than, than criminal networks who sort of go about their business without, without, uh, without applying, you know, high levels of violence because violence is one of the key harms of organised crime. And this, you know, to a large extent is, a, is looking at the harms caused by organised crime, right? Um, and so, so, you know, those criminal actors that, that don't use violence will, will, score, will score lower. Um, I think in terms of, you know, the interaction between violence and, and different illicit economies, you know, you can see it all over the world, whether it's within human trafficking, when violence and coercion is, you know, a, a defining feature of that criminal market. Um, but also when it comes to markets like um, artisanal gold mining in, in the Sahel, for example, and the, the sort of spillover effect of, of violence and instability that that um, criminal market where quite often, you know, armed groups, militias, terrorist organizations use that market as their funding. Um, you know, it's a vicious cycle of sort of self-perpetuating violence and instability, conflict, illicit economies and, and so on. And, and so, you know, as I said, violence isn't always a feature of illicit economies, but it is a, a very important one in a lot of a lot of different countries, a lot of different uh, cases and a lot of different illicit markets all across the world. Thank you. Um... Regarding the application of the index, how do you see, that's a question from Richard, um, how do you see the index supporting in practice uh, practitioners of, of public security, such as law enforcement, but also international organizations, financial institutions, and I should add also like national policymakers uh, in terms of tackling 
organized crime and tackling uh, financial types of crime that um, are highlighted, especially in the in the resilience type of uh, in terms of state uh, roles in in those um, in those types of crime. Um, thank you, Antonio. I can take that one if you don't mind. So dissemination activities have been uh, key for for us. Um, and we are now working on precisely dissemination. We're planning to do just that over the course of 2021, 2022. Sorry, um, the index findings are also being mainstreamed on all our uh, policy and pro programmatic um, work, so that the whole of the GI, as well as um, our networks, network of experts, which is quite extensive, more than 500 uh, people coming from different backgrounds, uh, including law enforcement, um, academia, media, um, uh, is working to disseminate the index and its findings. Um, and of course, uh, we are making use of all our resources to identify data gaps and, and other um, priorities. Thank you. Um, regarding uh, funding for, for this index, could you tell us a little bit more about or, or, or some information on the, um, on the funding that supported the um, production of the index? Um, yes, we have been very transparent about the funding. Uh, information on that is, of course, uh, available throughout the website, osindex.net. Um, we are partly funded by the Bureau of um, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, INL, part of the um, U.S. State Department. Um, and we are, of course, in part funded by uh, the Enact, Enact Africa, which is um, a, a joint initiative by um, ISS, um, Interpol, and of course, the uh, Global Initiative. Thank you. Um, a question to Laura. Why aren't certain uh, prominent types of, of, of criminality, such as um, cybercrime, not uh, primarily included in this uh, inaugural uh, edition of the index? Sure, thanks. We get this question quite a bit. Um, so the global index grew from the Enact Organized Crime Index for Africa, as, as Kosia mentioned, which featured the 10 criminal markets um, that are currently covered in the global iteration. Um, and so for the sake of comparability, uh, the same 10 markets were scored for the global index. Um, some criminal markets like cybercrime are more cross-cutting in nature and don't necessarily fit neatly into a state-based tool. Um, however, with that in mind, we are planning with future iterations of the global index to cover these additional markets. Um, and hopefully, I think in the one published in 2023, we'll have three additional markets uh, likely to include cybercrime as well. Sure. Um, a question that is partially uh, curios colleague curiosity and also a substantive um, discussion. Um, how has the COVID pandemic affected your uh, both your work, but also your uh, analysis or your finding? Did you uh, notice, and, and I ask this to anyone who dares <laughs> produce an answer, um, uh, how, how has this affected um, your analysis? Has, has it produced like a, a, a sudden shift in, 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 in criminal markets in, in cat certain categories that affected your, your um, that was observable in your, in your studies? Should I take that one? Or <laughs> I, can, I can take it as well if you want. Sure, I'll speak a little bit and then hand it over to you. So uh, COVID-19, as you can imagine, uh, of course, changed everything in our lives, including dynamics um, in terms of criminality and resilience. Um, throughout, while we were developing this tool uh, covering 2020, we always asked experts to, uh, at least in the short term, to the degree possible, to assess how COVID ha had affected uh, the different crime markets, the illicit flows and actor dynamics. Um, recognizing, of course, that it was unfolding as we were developing the tool. Uh, what I can say, so we've, we've tried to incorporate as much as possible in terms of the short-term effects of COVID, um, but with future iterations of the tool, hopefully we'll be able to see more of a, a longitudinal analysis of how the pandemic in the long term has affected uh, global dynamics on organized crime. Um, as far as impact of certain markets, um, 
maybe I, I'll speak a little bit and then hand it over to you, Leah. So Leah's mentioned a little bit in the in the slideshow, um, you know, markets like human trafficking, uh, the COVID pandemic in, in some sense could have isolated some victims of human trafficking. In other senses, they could have um, just diverted, they diverted state resources and attentions away from, from uh, security issues and more towards the immediate health crisis. And so in, 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 one, in one sense, it could have also um, uh, given the opportunity for, for, for criminal groups to operate more freely in a sense. Um, Leah, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, purely from a sort of operational perspective in terms of like data collection and stuff like that, obviously, um, you know, the vast majority of our data collection for the index is, is desk-based and we, we it's, you know, it's the experts that, that using their own knowledge and literature review and stuff like that. So I think in terms of our sort of process, you know, there was some disruption of course but 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 not nothing sort of debilitating right um but i think in terms of you know truly capturing the impact of, of the pandemic is is very difficult in a uh, sort of in the year that it's happening right because obviously you know the, the the collection process occurred throughout the year so you know there was data collection and, and assessments done at, at different stages of the year um but as laura said yeah i mean definitely you know in future iterations, which is what we've, we always say, you know, Laura mentioned it at the beginning, um, that one of the, you know, the objectives with future future iterations of the of the index is to be able to assess trends, right? Um, so, you know, in the next iteration, in two years time, we should be able to see, you know, well, what the experts judge there to have been an impact on. Um, and I think, yeah, Laura covered, I think, a lot of the major ones, but another one um, that sort of, you know, quite an important um, impact that, that the pandemic had on was on sort of criminal governance and, and, and gang recruitment. And for those of you who know, I don't need to be telling Antonio Sampaio about criminal governance in, in urban settings and the impact of, of, uh, of COVID on, on gang warfare and stuff like that. But, you know, in a lot of places around the world, with schools shut, with, uh, you know, unemployment skyrocketing, economic opportunities, you know, falling, in a lot of places that that sort of like heightened the vulnerability to recruitment into these gangs um you know whether that be in in in, in nairobi or in uh, you know rio de janeiro you know in a lot of places the the lack of an opportunity to go to school or to 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 work to to earn money sort of pushed them down into that um sort of down that road um so i think that that's one important uh, sort of ramification of the covid-19 pandemic um as well as of course other stuff that's not covered in the index at this you know for this iteration you know what we've seen in terms of um sort of when it comes to public procurement contracts and stuff like that um sort of you know government embezzlement uh, the issuing of contracts to you know on the basis of patronage networks and and uh, you know nepotism and that kind of thing uh, you know, all across the world, we've seen examples of, of, of governments acting in such in such a way, um, but also criminal criminal networks, you know, exploiting the, the new opportunities that were caused by the pandemic. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, it, it, you know, someone told you there was people trading, you know, in illegally, uh, illegally trading in, in counterfeit certificates for COVID tests or for, you know, for tests of any kind. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. Right. So, you know, the illicit trade of counterfeit masks, uh, of you know other forms of PPE, that kind of stuff that emanates you know directly from the pandemic is another way that that just new criminal opportunities have been um, have been sort of provided and and you know criminal actors took took their chance and, and went for it. Thank you. Um, in terms, of one uh, important global trend that um, is parallel to 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 the ones observed in the index. Um, and one that I've been observing more as, a, as an observer rather than an expert um, is the deterioration of democracy in certain countries, uh, including the one that I, I used to call home Brazil, uh, where, you know, where, where I was born. Uh, and and um, you, in the index, uh, it struck me, uh, one of the key findings was that democratic countries tend to have uh, better resilience to 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 organize crime, and I, w I wonder if you could, uh, if any of you could expand on uh, what sorts of characteristics of democratic uh, states 
um, jump out as, as being like particularly uh, important or cross-cutting that uh, strengthens the, the, the resilience to, to organize crime. And perhaps that is one key area in which um, this index could contribute to discussions on uh, democracy you know, uh, and, and strengthening up of state institutions in, 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 in some countries. Um, I, can, I can begin to answer that if you don't mind. So that relates to something that I said during my uh, part of the presentation. Um, of course, where checks and balances are present, uh, where civil society is active, where, where media enjoys um, the environment in which it is able to, to operate freely without um, interfere in any inter interference from the government. Um, these are some of the important characteristics that um, boost democracy or rather don't allow a backslide or, or make it more difficult for um, leaders to take advantage. Um, the COVID pandemic, of course, has been a, a key factor here. Um, we will be publishing something on, on the matter um, this month. So um, my appeal, go on to the website and, and stay tuned for that. Thank you. Um, add, sorry, sorry, go, go on, Laura. Just to add on to Kosio's answer, we're, I mean, as he mentioned, the correlation between uh, democratic uh, governance and versus authoritarian and how that relates to resilience. Uh, I just want to reiterate that if there is a correlation, it doesn't mean that one causes another. So what makes a country more or less resilient to organized crime will obviously vary on the context, uh, depending on the context. So it's not to say that democracies are void, they're perfect and they're, they're, they're void from organized crime. It just might look different um, in democracies. But just wanted to add that in there. Um, it's just on average that we're seeing based on the data that the index provides that dem having democratic values, um, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and having those checks and balances tend to uh, result in uh, frameworks that are becoming more resilient to organized crime. So, with that. so Richard uh, poses an interesting question. Um, uh, in my, my previous life, I've also uh, uh, followed some military and strategic studies um, discussions. So um, do you tailor for military units such as cyber warfare, counterterror, disinformation, and how it, it impacts um, uh, resilience or, or, or the fight against organized crime? And, and, and I'd like to broaden it and also ask, um, does... Um, have you have you factored into the index the military tools that some states, especially in Latin America, have used um, and have received, you know, uh, great criticism for, for doing so? Uh, understandably, for for the concerns that it has on of the impact it has on 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 democratic accountability, but some states do use military units, uh, military forces, or militarized forces. To, to fight crime. Has, has that impacted the, the index or, or, or your thinking uh, in terms of resilience? Sure, so what we've tried to advocate with the index, as you can see from the resilience uh, indicators, is really trying to advocate sort of multi-sectoral, uh, multilateral approach in responding to organized crime. So not necessarily criminal uh, justice or security driven, but really a holistic uh, all society approach, including civil society, including the media, including uh, different different areas. Um, that said, the Global Index really allows uh, a sort of foundational platform on which to build further uh, further research and analysis. So, if you if uh, someone wanted to use the tool to use it as a base, and then from there use that data to to build on um, an analysis on how military units uh, can uh, can respond to organized crime in a given context, that certainly that can that's certainly what it's there for. It's really to provide a foundation. But again, uh, we cover, we don't specialize, uh, we don't specify anything with regards to military units, except as it falls under mil uh, law enforcement capacity um, and as one of the indicators for, for the resilience. Yeah, I think yeah. that's one of the, sorry, sorry, go on, Lise. No, sorry, I was just a very, very small addition to that, just going off Laura's last point that under the law enforcement um, resilience indicator, we do take into account whether there are specialized units with the express task of um, 
you know, tackling organized crime. But as Laura mentioned, when she was going through the methodology, you know, when we look at resilience, we're looking at, you know, the presence of a resilience indicator, but also the effectiveness of it. And so that's when that would then play in issues of human rights abuses, issues of um, of extremely harsh militarization um, approaches that the experts judge to be counterproductive. Right. So that's where it comes in. It's it's not just a mere, you know, do they have them? Um, that makes their score go up or down is, well, what's the impact of them on resilience to organised crime? And so then that that's where that would play in. That's all I wanted to ask. Yeah. So we are now uh, five minutes. We have five minutes to go. Um, um, so for a last question, I would like to ask, um, what do you think the next steps will be in terms of the index? Uh, Laura has mentioned uh, potential for... Um, forward-looking or predictive tools that uh, could be integrated uh, in the index. Uh, I am particularly interested in following the index and the evolution and to be able to track the sort of evolution of the, of the, the score so that uh, we, know we, can, we can do more comparative studies in, in terms of, of time uh, on how, how each region and country sort of follow the different trends, political, economic, and social um, that'll be very interesting. But what are your thoughts on, on the next steps and um, how, how are you, have you already had uh, mental space to think about the next index? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so as I mentioned, next year we'll begin the development of the second iteration of the global tool um, with an expanded scope to include hopefully three additional criminal markets. Uh, but where I, where, I see the full potential of the tool really will be coming in even further iteration. So um, hopefully with time, stakeholders can use this longitudinal data um, and see where there are gaps, what other countries have done well, um, and really uh, form help form a sort of dialogue um, among stakeholders um, in their various contexts to, to work together. Um, but I also think that the index, even now, it's not that it's just even future iterations, but even now I think can help, like I said, provide really a platform to, to jump off. What it does now is offer a macro level analysis of what's going on, but uh, users can, can, can use all of that information to really delve down into you know, sub-national uh, analysis uh, or any particular theme or a geographic area to, to, to build on, um, depending on their, on their needs and, and the context that they're in. Sure. And well, if, mm -hmm, if I may add something um, on the um, next steps on the agenda, of course, um, this goes back to, to a, a question that uh, you posed a bit earlier. Um, we're planning for different dissemination activities. Um, of course, we have produced a wealth of data from the index. As you can imagine, more than 5,000 5, um, indicators have been scored. Um, 193 countries have been um, assessed as part of the index. So it is not surprising that we have um, incredible amounts of data. So based on that, we plan on uh, delving deeper and launching a podcast series at some point early next year. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, we will uh, be doing um, sort of short analytical pieces that we're, we are going to publish um, on the GI's website, as well as um, on the um, ocindex.net website. Well, thank you very much, Kozu, Lies, and Laura. Um, I think we've, uh, we're, we're going to close now as we have a very busy schedule in terms of the OC Index, sorry, of the 24-hour uh, conference. Hopefully your work on the OC Index is now uh, drawing to an end uh, in terms of dissemination. Um, so, um, so thank you very much. And for uh, you in the audience, you can access, of course, freely the index at ocindex.net. And I highly encourage you to, to do so. So continue to enjoy the organized crime, the 24 hour global organized crime conference. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the OC24 podcast. For more talks, have a look at the podcast feed on whichever platform you use. There are loads more to listen to. Video versions of these talks are also available on the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime YouTube channel. If you would like to share these talks around, we ask that you use the hashtag OC24 and let us know what you think. 
The 24-hour conference on global organised crime is brought to you by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group on Organised Crime, the Centre for Information and Research on Organised Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organised Crime and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. For more information, head over to oc24.globalinitiative.net. This has been the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Thanks for listening.